Welcome to week 14's lecture. I'm happy that you've joined us again today. Uh, we're going to be learning more about the Inuit people from the uh, far, far north. All right, so first thing up, as usual, is we'll take a look at the study guide, because that's always a good way to start each week, uh, finding out what it is that we're supposed to be learning about. Here we are with the week 14 study guide, and as we scroll down, we, of course, find some yellow highlighted blue font, extra good hints, and uh, we'll be talking about some of these things, including rotting food <laughs> in our PowerPoint, sled dogs, and so on. And also at the bottom, we have uh, an outline of the information that you should be watching for when you watch our video, which is Living Two Lives. The reason I'm scrolling down is because there's some quotes in here that are important for you to read and think about. Uh, it's possible that this quiz this week will have some essay questions that are based on this film. So be sure to carefully watch it and review all the different parts of this um, study guide. Here's the homeland for these people, very stretched out. And it's a little bit difficult with a flat map to get a concept that really this is the top of the globe, the North Pole. And then we look down and we see that uh, these um, tribes go, oops, here we go, uh, go all the way, almost halfway around the world. It's pretty amazing. Here's some important facts that are worth remembering. Uh, it's a very forbidding, cold environment up in the Arctic, and that they, uh, have land that stretches a very, very long way, over 4,000 miles. So to give you a perspective, the continental United States is about 3,000 miles. So it's another 1,000 miles beyond that, ticks six time zones. There's about 125,000 Inuit in Alaska and Canada. The number varies. Some I think last week we talked about 100,000 to 125,000. So if you're in that ballpark, you've kind of got the right idea about it as far as what to remember. And um, they are all united as far as having similar cultures to the same kind of environmental challenges. Maybe those two people look familiar to you if you've watched a certain TV show. Uh, facts worth remembering. An important um, physiological adaptation is that they are able to eat meat. Traditionally, all they ate was meat. And if you, they've done, they've had things happen where people have been lost in the woods. In one case, they found a man uh, on the continental United States who had been up in some mountains, and he was surrounded by uh, rabbit bones. He had killed and eaten lots and lots of rabbits, but he didn't have any other food, and he starved to death. Um, this is because uh, most people's, the physiology of the body is that if you only eat meat, that puts you into what's called ketosis, which is what people do when they lose weight uh, by being on the Atkins diet, for example. They're eating almost no carbohydrates, lots of meat, lots of fat, and the body uh, metabolizes that, but it can't turn it all into calories. And so it starts drawing down from the stores in your own body to eventually you'll lose all your weight, you'll die. But for some reason, the Arctic people's bodies have changed and allows them to do this. Traditionally, though, they did get a little bit of vegetables. And you might wonder, how could they eat vegetables if there's nothing but ice? What they would do is they, when they killed mammals that had seaweed and other sea kinds of plants inside of their bodies when they were dead, they would eat those. And that would give them important minerals and some carbohydrates, which would uh, enable them to be able to live on basically an all meat, mostly fat kind of meat uh, diet. And they did not, they do not seem to have uh, the ailments that might come with a, a different kind of diet. 
Well, this is kind of a joke. Uh, usually moose do not pull sleds, but dogs do. And you might remember that for the quiz. <laughs> and um, the uh, other thing to mention is that the Inuits had rituals to let the whales know that they should come to the their people and they would uh, try to persuade the whales to give themselves up so that they could be caught eaten. Uh, and you can see here some uh, kids eating some raw uh, whale blubber after a whale was killed. We might be thinking, well, you know, we love the whales. We want to protect them. We've been to Hawaii and we've seen uh, whale protection areas and whale watching trips and so on. And that's true. But the amount of whales that the Inuit people ate was, there weren't that many of them, there weren't many people. And there were lots of whales because it was before the Europeans came and started uh, killing whales to boil them down into whale oil, which was to light lamps or be used in medicines and so on. So back then, uh, the, the, um, the people from the north were not really having much of an impact on the total population of whales. And they had to eat something. So they ate whales, seals, fish. Uh, all the different kinds of creatures that were in the sea. So, you know, as far as role, uh, gender roles go and work, uh, the women would be sometimes help with the hunting and fishing, but a lot of work on making the meals and preserving the foods. Usually the Inuit people would have one large meal each day, usually in late afternoon or evening, and then the leftovers from that meal would be snacks the next day, which is kind of interesting because in traditional Ireland, they used to have an oat cake, kind of like oatmeal baked into a, a chunk <laughs> along with potatoes and other, if they could get it, meat. And the next morning, um, people would slice up that oat loaf and they would have that for breakfast. So having a big meal that later the next day that you would eat is not not that uncommon. Um, so the meats would be boiled in oil, roasted, and sometimes be allowed to partially decay or rot before eating. And there are people in other parts of the world that will have things such as fermented fish in a sauce. Uh, that was, uh, that's still being, um, you know, a popular kind of, um, of a condiment in uh, different parts of the world now and all the way back to the Roman days that they would they learn from the North African people about different kinds of fermented uh, fish and so on that would be used to spice up the food. As with almost all or all of the North American uh, nations, um, the Inuit believe that nature is in balance and has an order and that we are part of it that animals have souls or that they have spirits and we need to respect and that and follow certain rules about what we do be, before we hunt them, eat them, and how, how we treat them. You might not know that they believe that people have two souls in their bodies when they're alive. Uh, one's the breath of life that disappears when the person dies, so more of a material kind of a soul. The other is spiritual soul that separates from the body at death and will exist in the afterworld. And they had a goddess named Sedna, but also has other names uh, that lives at the bottom of the ocean and controls the annual supply of sea mammals so that hopefully, you know, we'll take care of the people by sending enough uh, sea mammals to them so that they can live. It's interesting that our text is mostly pretty negative about um, all religions except uh, uh, indigenous religion, but actually uh, kind of selects Russian Orthodox as being one that um, she seems to particularly like. And they did um, do things that were helpful. Um, so at the top bullet, you can see that they the Russian priests, Orthodox priests, when they were sent there, they were told under written policy that they had to respect the customs and cultures of the native peoples, um, to learn their languages, to, to take their, the Bible and translate it in, into 
from Russian into uh, the native people's languages. They created schools. They made a seminar in Sitka. Sitka is a little tiny fishing trading village. It's still pretty small. It's about maybe eight blocks by 10 blocks at most. And they made a, a seminary where locals could be trained to become Russian Orthodox priests and also helping with health care and, and try to make uh, more sanitary conditions for the people. This, this bit right here sounds like something somebody would make up to try to trick you on a quiz, but it's actually true. <laughs> and in 1884, the U.S. government passed the Alaska Organic Act, which back in those days, people didn't use the word organic that often. Um, but it said that the territorial government should not interfere with the indigenous people's traditional use of the land and the sea, and that... Um, that the, their children should be given an education. In the bottom picture here on the right, you see some traders. Uh, the, first there were French traders, then English, then Russian, then American. All came to trade, um, hunt for whales, because they made a lot of money killing whales and boiling them down. And they would often hire the local uh, indigenous people. About after about 1945, six, seven, when we became engaged in a cold war with Russia, which was at that point the uh, Soviets, um, they decided, and our, our government decided that we wanted to know if Russian missiles were on the way to hit our country. And so they built 50 radar stations. It cost $600 million. And here's a picture of one of them. And um, some of the people, local people, of course, not only got to help work on making these stations, but um, doing some work on maintenance, although it was mostly U.S. military. Um, when Teddy Roosevelt was president back in those days, people were becoming interested in national parks and protecting animals and so on. And they thought, well, we'll keep people from hunting these migratory birds uh, May through September. Well, that's when they actually go up to the north from southern places. So if you were in the south, you could shoot one of these birds, but if you were in the north, you couldn't. <laughs> and that didn't really fly very well, if you will, with the Alaskan people, including the native people. So eventually they did repeal that law. The tribes have um, formed cooperatives, and they're able to market or sell um, items that they make. And some of these items go and are sold not only in Canada and the United States, but as far away as Europe. So it's been a good source of income to make various traditional type of objects that can be sold. A lot of other tribes do that within the United States. For example, the Hopis have their own store and the local uh, Hopis, this is in Arizona, um, make uh, non-religious uh, items that can be sold in that store. So, that, for example, they'll have certain kinds of kachinas that they're allowed to sell, silver and turquoise work, that inlaid work, that kind of thing, but not something that's a sacred item. Unfortunately, I don't know if you would know what a PCV is, but it's a chemical that used to be used a lot. And um, sometimes it would spill from, let's say, an electronic electric transformer that PG&E or some utility has put up. Uh, it's also had leaked out from other sources. And it's one of these forever chemicals. It does not biodegrade. It stays in the environment forever, pretty much. They've been banned since 77, but they're already out there. And you can see this chart the blood level of Arctic residents. I was like, well, why is it so high? It's because these chemicals are stored in the fat of whatever animal they come in contact with, animal or human. It's in the fat. And the native peoples need to eat the fatty tissue of all of these different marine animals and fish and bears. 
So they eat them. The fat from the animal that has the PCB goes into the fat of the humans, and it just stays there uh, until they die. So you, you can't get rid of it. So that they can test, and they found out all of these Arctic peoples have very high levels, which is a serious long-term problem. We need to continue to think about that, work on that, see if there's some way of making it so that in the future people don't get as much of the PCBs in them. All right, so now we're going to be hearing a traditional folk tale. <laughs> 